In this final set of videos uh, and lectures on cardiovascular disease, uh, I'm going to focus on cardiac diseases specifically. We already looked in the last set of videos at um, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, angina, and heart failure. And here we'll focus on arrhythmias. Uh, and then in the next videos, we'll look at valvular heart disease, uh, heart muscle disease like myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, and then finally, diseases of the pericardium. So arrhythmias, also known as dysrhythmias or irregular heartbeats, um, this is an irregularity in the heart's beating pattern. Um, and as a result of that irregularity, it causes a, a mechanically insufficient contraction of the heart muscle. So there's decreased cardiac output. Um, and this is either a problem of one of the pacemakers in the heart, such as the SA node or the AV node, or a problem somewhere in the conducting system, uh, either in the atria or in the ventricles. And as we'll see, we tend to classify these arrhythmias either as supraventricular above the ventricle, so somewhere in the conducting system above the ventricles, or uh, ventricular. Um, remember that with the ECG, um, if you forget uh, that, you should go back and review that. We have a typical tracing that looks like this at the right, where we have a P wave, and that signifies atrial depolarization, and then muscle contraction happens at the same time. And then the QRS complex, this is signifying ventricular depolarization and contraction, and then a T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization. Uh, and then we have these different intervals, which are important, um, and they will often be affected with the different arrhythmias. So for instance, the PR interval is the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. Um, uh, we have the uh, QT interval, which occurs from the beginning of QRS to the end of the T wave, and then the ST segment. Uh, we saw that in the previous, previous video, looking at myocardial infarction and how an infarction, uh, especially with the ST segment elevated myocardial infarction, the STEMIs, uh, the ST segment is elevated. Um, so those are important segments to understand because on the EKG, we can measure their duration and we can see with different arrhythmias that they're uh, disturbed. Okay, so the symptoms of arrhythmia um, can be benign. Um, and um, so typically those uh, arrhythmias don't involve the heart's pacemakers. And uh, I'll talk about, for example, premature ventricular and atrial contractions. Those are typically benign arrhythmias, um, but they can be more serious. They can lead to decreased cardiac output with lightheadedness, fainting, shortness of breath or chest pain. Um, many arrhythmias are asymptomatic. So people actually don't know they're having them until they maybe get an EKG or, or something like that. And then uh, some of the arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, because they cause turbulence in the atrial chambers uh, can predispose a person to stroke uh, over time, uh, can develop heart failure or even cardiac arrest. So with arrhythmias, we always want to do a full workup to be sure that you know this is not something more serious that needs more urgent uh, attention. Remember with the conducting system, we have the SA node and that kind of sets the pacing of the heart and the average person that beats anywhere spontaneously between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Uh, and that's located up here in the right atrium. Uh, then the uh, signal from that goes out uh, through the cardiac myocytes, the, the specialized conducting myocytes through the atria. And then all of it has to collect here at the AV node Remember, there's no way that the signal, because of the way the heart, the valves are formed and whatnot, that the electrical signal can get from the atria to the ventricles without passing through the AV node. Now, there's a couple of exceptions. You can have an anatomical variant called the bundle of Kent, which can actually pass the signal into the left atrium, the left ventricle, um, and that can actually cause a very dangerous arrhythmia. We'll talk about that, something called Wolf-Parkinson-White. Um, but uh, that and that can degenerate into something further. But basically, uh, most in most hearts, the signal from the atria has to collect down the AV node. Then it's going to go down the so-called bundle of Hiss into the left and right bundle branches, and then it's going to move up the Purkinje fibers, which are located in the subendocardium, uh, up the ventricular wall. Uh, so that's the uh, typical conduction. Uh, the AV node, importantly, has sort of a, a function of slowing the signal from the atria uh, as they pass into the ventricles. And that actually allows the ventricles to relax in diastole and completely fill with blood uh, before the next contraction cycle occurs. Um, so typically, the AV node filters, slows down the impulses 
Um, and uh, remember, it on its own can actually uh, have its own intrinsic rhythm somewhere between 40 and 60 beats per minute uh, if the SA node goes offline. So uh, when we have cases of bradycardia, we might see that one of the reasons for that is that the SA node is not firing and the AV node is taking over. Um, typically, the atria will uh, the AV node will block any impulses uh, greater than 180 beats per minute. So if you have a very rapid atrial pacing, uh, the AV node acts as a filter to block that to prevent the ventricles from over uh, over pacing and, and beating too quickly. Um, so what are the causes of arrhythmias? Well, similar, um, there can be a lot of different ones, similar risk factors for cardiovascular disease in general. Um, any sort of underlying heart disease will predispose a person to arrhythmias. Um, typically with, with uh, cardiovascular disease, um, there's a damage to either the pacemakers or conducting system. So things like ischemic heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease, if a person's had an MI, uh, they're going to be more susceptible, again, to different arrhythmias. Uh, cardiomyopathy, which again is a disorder of the heart muscle itself. Uh, heart valve disorders can predispose to arrhythmias, different congenital defects of the conducting system, and then uh, either current or uh, having had historically infections such as endocarditis, which is an infection on the inner lining of the heart, myocarditis, infection of the heart muscle, or pericarditis, infection of the pericardium. And then heart failure, those patients are more susceptible to different arrhythmias as well. But there can be factors outside the heart that predispose to arrhythmias. So metabolic issues, such as changes in the three major electrolytes, uh, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. These would be the three uh, big ones. So decreased uh, potassium, calcium, and magnesium all predispose to arrhythmias. Uh, stimulants like caffeine, amphetamine, cocaine, uh, alcohol, and uh, different drugs like digoxin and so forth. Um, there can be neuroendocrine causes, so increased stress response, increased sympathetic tone with HPA axis activation, lack of sleep with low melatonin, uh, any sort of thyroid toxicosis, increased thyroid hormone, even um, subclinical hyperthyroidism predisposes people to arrhythmias. Insulin resistance, I put a question mark, but we suspect that can cause changes in the uh, metabolic activity of the myocytes, which predispose to arrhythmias. Uh, adrenal function with low androgens, low DHEA, but high cortisol and high aldosterone. Overactivation specifically of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We've talked about that before. Uh, after menopause, low estrogen. And then in males, low testosterone, all predisposed to different arrhythmias, specifically in males, low testosterone is correlated with atrial fibrillation. Um, the assessments would include, of course, feeling the pulse, but the pulse um, is not going to be accurate for diagnosing a lot of arrhythmias. And that's because, remember, that the, um, the arteries act like a pressure reservoir, so they're going to kind of take up, if there's a very rapid beating of the heart, uh, of the atria, for example, uh, not all those uh, beats will conduct down to the ventricles because the AV node, remember, acts as a filter there. So you can have a very rapid atrial pacing, but the ventricles maybe are rapid, but they're not uh, super rapid. So um, you actually can't diagnose the atrial arrhythmias from the pulse alone. Um, but pulse might be the first indicator that we have an issue, and we might feel rapid pulse or very slow pulse. Again, tachycardia is anything over 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia is uh, 60 beats per minute or less. Um, but, um, and we can also feel an irregular pulse. But basically, we need an EKG or an ECG uh, or a 24-hour halter monitor uh, or a cardiac event monitor where a person can wear that for several weeks. And every time they feel an abnormal heart rhythm, they can hit a little button and it starts to record their um, their ECG tracing with a lot of uh, uh, different uh, devices like the Apple Watch and whatnot. Now we can record single lead ECGs and that's another way of tracking this. Um, electrocardiogram um, or some echocardiogram could be helpful if we suspect a valve problem, heart failure and so forth. Um, so that's the different causes and assessment of arrhythmias. Um, now the types of arrhythmias would be uh, for example, extra beats, and we call those the premature atrial contractions or premature ventricular contractions. These are benign. This is where people feel an extra beat or a skip beat. Um, now, uh, I'll talk a bit about PVCs in particular, because if you get lots of PVCs, 
frequently, that could be an indicator of underlying heart disease that needs to be further investigated. But the majority of these are due to things like caffeine and stress and things like that, and so they resolve uh, on their own usually. Um, there can be bradyarrhythmias uh, or conduction abnormalities. So bradyarrhythmias, again, a pulse uh, less than 60. Um, and uh, that can be due to the sinus uh, SA node not firing. We call that a sinus bradycardia. Um, there could be a sick sinus syndrome where the SA node is not firing healthily at all. Um, or it could be due to a heart block, and that's a block in the AV node or down in the bundle branches or, or the uh, bundle of his, et cetera. So those would be bradyarrhythmias. There are tachyarrhythmias, and that's where the pulse is over 100 beats per minute. And they can be supraventricular. And uh, again, that's above the ventricles. So that would include sinus tachycardia, uh, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, uh, what's called multifocal atrial tachycardia. I'll go through all these here coming up. Uh, and then atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia, AVNRT atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia, AVRT, and then paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Um, so these would all be differentiated based on the presentation, but also the ECG findings. Um, and then their ventricular arrhythmias, these are much more severe because they're gonna affect the actual major pumping aspect of the heart, the ventricular chambers. And uh, this can be a ventricular tachycardia, what we call monomorphic waves or polymorphic, uh, I'll talk about the difference there. And then uh, ventricular fibrillation, this uh, is uh, will quickly degenerate into asystole unless a person is defibrillated. So when we talk about using the defibrillator uh, with CPR and whatnot, these patients are in ventricular fibrillation. And when you defibrillate them, they hopefully will go back to a normal rhythm. Um, so those are, that's a summary just quickly of the most common types of arrhythmias. There's, there's many other uh, less common variants, but this is, uh, this is uh, the, more, the most common ones. And it's, again, important to know a little bit clinically about how they might present and when we might need to make a referral for a more appropriate assessment. So I'll start here with ectopic beats. Uh, this is the most common disorder of rhythm. Uh, it's felt as a single beat that's out of time with the rest of the regular, um, the uh, rest of the regular heart rhythms. Um, so regular regular rhythms of the heartbeats. Um, it can be symptomatic, uh, or the patient can be unaware of it. Um, but typically, people will feel like a skip beat. Um, it's most common at rest and in older patients. Uh, again, the majority are benign with ectopic beats. Um, but may need treatment if more symptomatic and may need further uh, assessment. So premature atrial contractions, these are extra atrial beats. Uh, they're common in healthy people. They're not harmful. They usually don't require any treatment. Uh, and they often develop in response to stress, lack of sleep, or caffeine. Um, patients may feel chest palpitations or anxiety. Feels like the heart stops for a couple of seconds and restarts. Um, and uh, again, this is usually, uh, doesn't require treatment, maybe some electrolyte replacement like magnesium would be something to think about, and then eliminating any triggers. But if you look at the EKG, uh, ECG, what you'll see is typically, so here we have a normal uh, PQRS complex with a T wave, uh, but notice that we get down here, uh, actually, we'll start at the beginning here. Notice that normally after the T wave, there should be a pause and then the next P wave should occur. Uh, notice here, you're actually not getting that pause, right? You know, as we're going into recovery where the ventricles are repolarizing, remember that's what the T wave is, uh, we get an immediately another, so here's a T wave, and immediately another P wave on top of that. So it's basically an extra beat. And what this is, is usually what we call an ectopic focus. This is an area somewhere in the atria the myocytes there are acting as a spontaneous pacemaker and they are setting a pace faster than the SA node. Uh, and so when they fire, they release a discharge and that causes a normal conduction down the AV node, normal QRS complex, but it's going to occur prematurely. So this, this is indicating there's a focus outside the SA node that's firing. So that's one uh, very common type of arrhythmia. So that's a PAC. Uh, a PVC would be um, similar, but this is occurring in the ventricles. And if you look at the ECG, um, you see again a, uh, you know, let's look here. You see a P wave, here's a QRS complex, here's the T wave, uh, there's a pause. But instead of a P wave, now we get this weird looking 
wave here, this is actually a widened QRS complex. This tells us that there is an ectopic focus somewhere in the ventricles that's firing, and it's overwhelming the P wave, and so we don't see it. The P wave's buried in that complex. Then it, there's a pause, and then we get another normal P wave. Here's another normal QRS. Here's another normal, and then suddenly, boom, another uh, extra firing. So somewhere in the ventricles, there is a little group of myocytes that are firing on their own. Um, so the, the widened QRS complex is a characteristic sign of that. Usually uh, there's a little pause. Um, so if you notice with the uh, widened QRS, this pause is a little bit longer than the typical pause between uh, the, uh, the next heart rhythm. So that's where people feel like the heart stops a little bit. Um, the um, common causes would be things like maybe hypoxia to the heart muscle wall, decreased electrolytes, again, magnesium, calcium, potassium, uh, could be a thyroid issue, especially increased thyroid, uh, generally harmless, occurs in healthy people. Uh, but again, if they're happening frequently, and some argue that if we're seeing, you know, more than uh, 60, 70 percent PVCs on the ECG, uh, we should go and do a little further workup, look for any coronary artery disease, any structural problems in the heart, do a full metabolic workup to make sure there's nothing else maybe contributing to them. Uh, they're typically asymptomatic, but people can feel these sort of rapid, uh, sort of jumped, skip beats. Again, the sensation of maybe a pause in the heart rhythm would be characteristic. Um, so again, most of these cases, we just kind of look at supportive factors. Uh, and then potentially, if it's happening too frequently, uh, typically what's given are things to control the rate, like beta blockers or maybe calcium channel blockers as medication. Um, okay, so uh, that is premature ventricular and atrial contractions. These are types of ectopic beats. By far, the majority of them are benign. Okay, next let's look at sinus or bradyarrhythmias. So let's focus on sinus bradycardia first. And again, this, these are all going to present with a uh, heart rate less than 60 uh, clinically. So the ECG findings will see a normal sinus rhythm, and which means that we see normal P, QRS, uh, T waves, and they're um, you know, happening at regular intervals, but they're happening slowly. So the P waves are firing less than 60 times uh, per minute. Um, and the ventricular rate goes under 60. Um, typically, this is asymptomatic and benign, uh, but it can be more severe. And if the pulse rate slows down way too much, uh, we might start to see decreased cardiac output with lightheadedness, syncope, chest pain, and low blood pressure. Um, the cause can be something as simple as just being very fit, athletic or cardiac conditioning. So people that are you know, marathon runners or do a lot of intense aerobic training, they might just have resting heart rates that are below 60. And so that's where we can just gather from the history. You know, a young, healthy person, if it's not causing any symptoms, um, we tend not to then do any further workup. Um, can happen with extreme cold, um, more in extreme hypothyroidism. So that would be part of our workup to assess for that. Um, any sort of sinus node dysfunction, like if there's been an MI that's affected, uh, caused a minor infarct in the sinus node, that could contribute to that. And then different drugs like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, which you can get from your history to see if they're taking those. Um, no treatments needed if asymptomatic. Um, if it, it is asymptomatic, sometimes atropine is used. Atropine basically blocks your parasympathetic nervous system. So that's going to increase sympathetic outflow to the heart. That'll increase heart rate. In very severe cases, a patient might need actually a pacemaker. Um, so that is sinus bradycardia. Now, similar to that would be sick sinus syndrome, or we call tachycardia bradycardia syndrome. And this is actually a group of disorders, not a single one, caused by malfunction in the SA node. Um, and it leads to intermittent supraventricular tachycardias followed by bradycardia. So people are going from really slow heart rates of very fast back and forth um, at intervals. And that can induce syncope, palpitations, dyspnea, chest pain. Um, because of the irregular beating of the atrial chambers, it can lead to increased incidence of TIAs, transient ischemic attacks in the brain, and ischemic stroke. Um, remember, the AV node, again, can beat on its own at 40 to 60 beats per minute. So basically, if the SA node, uh, in this case, in the sick sinus syndrome, is not properly functioning, the AV node can take over, and that's enough to retain consciousness in the resting state. But with any exertion, a person's going to be symptomatic. Uh, 
Um, the treatment for this is, and I've actually had a patient with this, you know, people were kind of, uh, she was suffering from very slow heart rate. She was in her late sixties. Um, she was fairly fit, but not, not an athlete of any sort. And, um, she would have a, she had a very slow heart rate of about 50. And then, um, she would get these runs of tachycardia in the one twenties and then go back down to 50. And she was very symptomatic during these episodes. Um, she would have to rest all day and so forth. So she had been to a number of providers um, more adjunctively, and they're giving her herbal therapies to work with her adrenals and all this. And finally, we uh, actually she came to see me, and we did an ECG, and uh, it was pretty clear she had the signs of sick sinus syndrome. So we sent her to a cardiologist, and uh, within a week she had a pacemaker placed. Um, and uh, so this is actually the most common indication for a pacemaker. And why her SA node was damaged, it's hard to say, but the suspicion was she probably had a previous silent MI, and uh, that probably weakened her SA node. Um, so that is sick sinus syndrome. Just know that if you have patients with, you know, that present like that, they may, may need actually an intervention like a pacemaker. The next bradyarrhythmias would be the heart blocks, and these are due to a blocked conduction through areas of damaged heart tissue. Um, it's a common finding. It's often incidental in elderly patients. It's, uh, some, some of these are asymptomatic and uh, don't really need any further treatment. Um, but it can lead to a regular pulse with skip beats. It can lead to generally a slower pulse. Um, with a complete heart block, there is no conduction of the atrial signals to the ventricles. And so the ventricle, ventricular pacemakers take over, again, at a much slower rate, usually around 40 beats per minute. Um, so the ventricles start to pace on their own, but there's no synchronization with the atria. Um, and this can cause a steep drop in cardiac output, resulting in fainting, and that's called the Stokes-Adams attack. So that's just the syncope or fainting due to loss of cardiac output due to a heart block. Um, so there's different types. So a first degree, and we'll focus, there's actually blocks up in the SA node and so forth, but we're going to focus on the most common ones, and that would be the AV block. Um, so there's, they're classified as first, second, and third degree AV blocks. So this is a blockage through the AV node. Um, so with a first degree AV block, basically, um, these are often asymptomatic cases. Um, there's no drop or skip beats, but we get a very long PR interval. So here's a P wave, and here is your PR interval. Um, and we can actually calculate this, and that's why this graph paper is used, because each little block actually indicates a, a segment of time. And uh, so we get a PR node that's actually greater than 200 milliseconds. And so that is um, a characteristic of a first degree heart block. But notice that there's the, the signal is passing to the ventricles. We get a normal QRS complex, normal T wave, and then the next one begins, but again, there's this delay. And the delay is constant between each P wave and QRS complex. So that's typical of a first degree heart block. Um, this can occur in healthy individuals. Uh, sometimes it can just be due to increased vagal tone, so too much uh, parasympathetic tone, uh, but different drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers can also trigger this. Uh, a second degree heart block, also known as Mobitz type one, is where the PR interval actually lengthens. So we get a, uh, in the diagram over here to the right, we get a P wave, um, QRS complex, there's a T wave, um, and then notice that the uh, next P wave is actually over here, it's lengthening each time. So they actually show you the PR intervals down here. Here's a P wave that's actually right after the T wave, and here's a very long uh, PR interval and so forth. So what happens is you get these lengthening PR intervals, and then eventually a beat is dropped. Um, so uh, that happens, you can actually see, here's the QRS wave, here's, a, here's what would be a drop beat right there. So basically, um, the uh, secondary heart block, it's a, just a lengthening PR interval each time until you drop a beat. And then it resets, it repeats. Uh, most of these cases are asymptomatic, um, but again, different things like the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, increased vagal tone, any underlying infarction could all be associated with it. Um, atropine might be needed here as, as an agent. So that's a Mobitz type one, secondary heart block. Mobitz type two, 
a sec it's also classified as a second degree AB block. Uh, and this is what we get an unexpected drop beat without any change in the PR interval. So if you look over at the ECG tracing, um, we have uh, one example here where we get a, here's a P wave, here's the QRS complex, here's the T wave, here's another P wave, boom, there's no QRS complex here. And then another P wave, normal QRS and so forth. And then way over here, you see another P wave and then you know no QRS complex. So we just suddenly drop a QRS complex. And that means that again, the P wave signal, the atrial signal is not getting down to the ventricles. Um, and this typically is a little bit more asymptomatic. Um, people will get more syncope from this. Um, and this usually is more serious. It indicates some sort of fibrotic disease in the conduction system. Uh, so there's been some scarring, fibrosis. Again, MI is a very common thing, but can be from any longstanding inflammatory or uh, atherosclerotic change in the heart. Um, and uh, so this typically will require a pacemaker because it can degenerate quickly into a third degree AV block, uh, also known as a complete heart block. And in this case, there is no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complex. So if you look over at the ECG tracing, uh, here's a P wave, no QRS, here's a P wave, QRS, uh, P wave, no QRS, P wave, no QRS, here's a P wave, here's a QRS, but they're not really, the interval is so short. This tells us that the atria are firing independently of the ventricle. So the ventricle has taken over its own pacing. So it's still maintaining a uh, ventricular contraction, but at a much slower rate. And usually this is very symptomatic. Um, there's a lot of syncope, dizziness, and this is where patients will have the Stokes Adams attacks. Um, now the heart rate can actually increase after that because the heart tries to compensate. So the sympathetic nervous system gets kicked up um, to try to get your cardiac output up. And so you might get tachycardia after those episodes. Uh, usually this is indi indicative of a more serious fibrotic condition of the conduction system. Um, this also occurs in Lyme, chronic Lyme disease. So this is one of the concerns of chronic Lyme is that uh, untreated is that it affects both the nervous system, but also the cardiac conduction system. And uh, so a third degree heart block is one possible consequence of that. And this, uh, the treatment here actually again requires a pacemaker because these patients are, uh, this, is, this can be a potentially lethal rhythm um, if uh, the ventricles essentially are not able to maintain the pacing, uh, the cardiac output will be insufficient. So that is uh, the, the basic types of AV block, um, first, second, the two types of second degrees, MOBITS 1, MOBITS 2, and the third degree uh, AV block. So let's jump now to tachyarrhythmias, and we'll start with supraventricular tachyarrhythmias. Um, so a sinus tachycardia is just a normal response to fear, pain, exercise. So when your heart rate goes really quick, that's called sinus tachycardia. Uh, and that can be secondary to anxiety, pregnancy, hyperthyroidism, severe anemia, fever, uh, or pulmonary embolism. So basically things outside the heart trigger an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And so a patient will present with very, very fast heart rhythm, again, over 100 beats per minute. Uh, but the uh, ventricular rate is regular. The, there's normal QRS complexes and so forth. And so the treatment here is just to address the underlying cause. Now, more concerning is atrial flutter. Uh, so an atrial flutter rhythm is a very rapid but organized rhythm. So if you look at the ECG tracing, these are P waves down here. Uh, they're very rapid, so we're getting like three P waves or four P waves. And then this is the QRS complex. Um, and then a P wave, P wave, P wave, QRS complex. So basically, in this case, about every three, sometimes every two, sometimes every four, um, atrial beats is being conducted to the ventricles. And we call, we call that, for example, three are firing three to one um, uh, conduction. Uh, it could be a two to one conduction or a four to one conduction. But basically, um, the AV node is filtering a lot of these P waves. So what's happening here is there's an ectopic focus firing somewhere in the atria. It's overwhelming the SA node, but the AV node is filtering them. So it's only conducting periodically down to the ventricles. Uh, but importantly, in atrial flutter, it's uh, regular. So it's rapid but organized. Uh, so the atrial rhythm goes to about 240 to 320 beats per minute. 
but because of the filtering effect of the AV node, uh, the ventricles are only firing at about 150 beats per minute, about half of that. So again, um, if it's half, it would be a two to one conduction. Um, this uh, is, uh, most often occurs with underlying cardiovascular disease, uh, can occur in healthy people, but typically um, there's something, some fibrotic tissue or something in the atria that's causing a premature uh, ectopic uh, focus. So focus just means an area of myocytes that are firing like a pacemaker on their own. Um, the signal then cycles around the atria. We call that a re-entrant rhythm. So it kind of goes in sort of a spiral because remember it can't conduct between the atria and the ventricles except to the AV node. So this signal just kind of loops around the atria. Uh, and this causes the atria to fire abnormally. So they, they just sort of they fire very rapidly, regularly, but it's definitely not a normal rhythm. Uh, and this can decrease cardiac output. So a patient will have the tachycardia because of the quick ventricular rhythm, but also shortness of breath, lightheadedness, and so forth. Now, unfortunately, this is not a stable rhythm. It frequently degenerates into atrial fibrillation, uh, which we'll talk about next, which has a lot more serious consequences. Uh, but some cases can persist uh, for months to years. Um, so this is basically the tachycardia is it's happening so quickly that the ventricles can't actually fill in diastole adequately so the cardiac output decreases uh, and this can cause uh, lead to heart failure in some it can even lead to an mi um, the rapid uh, sort of beating of the atria the inadequate filling of the ventricles causes the blood basically to pool in the atrial chambers and this is going to increase the risk of thrombi forming and those can embolize to the brain causing stroke. And so atrial flutter, like the next one, atrial fib, fibrillation is gonna require usually uh, some sort of anticoagulant therapy to prevent that. Um, sudden cardiac death is another possible consequence here. And that can occur in those with um, a couple of underlying conditions. I mentioned that you can have what's called an accessory pathway in the atria called the bundle of Kent. And uh, unfortunately, what that does is it bypasses the AV node. It allows signals to go directly from the atria to the ventricles and uh, creates one-to-one -one conduction. And what happens is the atria just start to, uh, you know, the, the ventricles start to fire too quickly, contract too quickly. They can go into fibrillation and that causes V-fib and that can result in uh, going to asystole and death. Um, so atrial flutter is one of the more serious arrhythmias we have to consider, and uh, this needs proper workup and treatment. Um, so the treatment would be number one, stroke prevention, and that would be with anticoagulants like warfarin or the novel uh, oral anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents like aspirin or the Plavix and so forth. Um, the second aspect would be prevent the circulatory instability. And that is approached through a couple different methods, either rate control, and that is with beta blockers uh, like metoprolol, bisoprolol, and so forth, or calcium channel blockers like biltiazem, verapamil. Uh, that's doing what's called rate control. So that's just trying to bring the rate of that ectopic focus down. Um, and then hopefully the SA node will, its own firing will overcome that focus and the heart will entrain again to the SA node. Um, there's also what's called rhythm control uh, or chemical cardioversion, and that is using the class three antiarrhythmics, the potassium channel blockers. Um, and this can, uh, this is a more advanced class of medication. I don't talk much about it because we don't use it much in primary care settings, but cardiologists would certainly focus on this. And that is another uh, way of kind of reducing the rhythm is to use the potassium channel blockers. Remember, they slow the conduction through the conducting pathways. Um, electrical cardioversion would be another method, and that's basically where uh, a person is given almost like a defibrillator, an external um, electrical current, and hopefully that will reset, that uh, can overwhelm that ectopic focus, so shut it down temporarily, and then the SA node should come online and uh, reset the heart rhythm. Uh, a treatment for chronic uh, flutter or fibrillation we'll see in the next one is cardiac ablation and that's typically where a uh, catheter is put in through a coronary artery and that area so electrophysiologists can identify exactly where in the atria that focus is located um, and they can uh, go into the appropriate coronary artery and then through a radio frequency device they can ablate the underlying, the myocardium. They can actually just basically sear it off 
it will eventually scar over and whatnot, but it'll block that, uh, it'll take out that extra focus. So that's called uh, catheter ablation. Uh, and that's performed usually as an outpatient procedure in a cardiac electrophysiology lab. Uh, I've had patients with AFib, the next category, where you know, that we are able to maintain a fairly constant rhythm with the rate control, different uh, adjunctive therapies and whatnot. Uh, but it wasn't until they got the ablation that it was basically completely cured and they didn't have to take those medicines anymore. Uh, the problem with ablation is it's not always 100% successful. Uh, the actual procedure itself can create more scar tissue, which can potentially create more ectopic foci, uh, and that can create another uh, arrhythmia. So it's not 100% curative, but if it works, it can be quite effective. So that's atrial flutter. That's one of our first arrhythmias we need to know about that can be uh, concerning here in terms of the uh, tachyarrhythmias. And then we have atrial fibrillation, AFib. Um, and this is uh, very common and it's important to be able to stand to recognize this in our patients who have not been previously diagnosed um, and to know kind of what the basic approach in terms of workup and treatment uh, is for this biomedically. So the ECG findings here be a very rapid but disorganized, uh, so irregular atrial rhythm. So if you look at the ECG tracing at the bottom here, um, here we have atrial flutter with the classic sawtooth pattern that we saw in the last uh, slide. Uh, but now we get in the top part here, atrial fibrillation, we get you know these P waves, kind of as another buried P wave here. Um, and so basically we're getting uh, an abnormal rhythm. So notice the QRS complexes are happening at random times. So that's gonna be the difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation is that fibrillation is rapid but disorganized. Um, usually we have a ventricular rate that's faster than a, uh, atrial flutter, and that's uh, maybe our atrial flutter, if it's a two to one conduction, is around 150 beats per minute. Here we get like 200 beats per minute. Uh, no discernible P waves, so it's actually hard to see the P waves as we saw in that tracing. And then uh, a variable in a regular QRS response. Uh, this is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. And there's different types. Um, the three basic types are paroxysmal, meaning it just kind of comes up out of nowhere, get a single episode, it goes away. We just sort of monitor for it, but we're not really concerned about you know, uh, it happening again necessarily. That's paroxysmal. Persistent is when it persists. When you get uh, an episode of AFib, it lasts for hours, uh, it may go on, but then you, know, you get a normal uh, rhythm reestablished um, it goes away, but then it sort of comes back. Uh, that's more persistent. Permanent is when uh, no amount of rate control or rhythm control seems to bring it back into a normal rhythm. Uh, so that's more permanent uh, AFib. Uh, the presentation can be asymptomatic, uh, especially in the more paroxysmal types. But typically I've had you know, patients with this will say they, they know it when they're having an episode, presents with chest pain, uh, shortness of breath and palpitations. Uh, you can feel an irregularly irregular pulse on physical exam. Um, and with the uh, new watches, like the Apple Watch, they actually have a feature for patients with AFib that the watch will monitor for that rhythm. And whenever that's occurring, it'll alert the patient that uh, they're going into an episode. Um, the irregular beating of the atrial chambers, again, will increase the risk of atrial thrombosis. And those can embolize to the brain causing stroke or TIA. Um, and uh, the risk of stroke actually is seven times higher in AFib patients than in the general population, which is why some form, especially for the persistent and permanent types, some form of anticoagulation is going to be important. Um, the causes are usually degeneration of the SA node. And so what happens then is that the SA node can't stimulate the, can't act as the pacemaker for the atria, and so secondary pacemakers take over. Um, there can be acute causes, so acute atrial fibrillation can happen from pulmonary disease, uh, cardiac ischemia, rheumatic heart disease, severe anemia, uh, hyperthyroidism, or any sort of thyroid toxicosis like overtaking thyroid hormone, uh, uh, alcohol, ethanol, and sepsis, uh, systemic bacterial infection. Uh, chronic AFib, though, typically is related to things like chronic hypertension, congestive heart failure, maybe having a previous MI or a silent MI. So those are the typical causes of AFib, but again, very common, very important to uh, understand how it presents and, and what we need to do about it.
So the treatment is gonna be similar to atrial flutter. Again, the assessment's gonna be with ECG. And uh, one of the things we do with the assessment, uh, which I'll just mention down below here, is we um, can use different scoring systems to determine uh, what the need for anticoagulation is. So not all patients will need anticoagulation, but to do that uh, for stroke prevention, we use what's called either the CHADS2 or CHADS2 VASC scoring system. Um, and that's what's depicted below here in the slides. So um, here we have the CHADS. And so C represents congestive heart failure, H hypertension, A is age over 75, D is diabetes, and S2 is stroke or TIA. So if a person has, you know, a CHADS score of zero um, with AFib, then typically we recommend just aspirin. Uh, but if they have a CHADS score of one or going up into two now or three, uh, up to six, we're going to do uh, some degree of, uh, they usually are recommended some degree of anticoagulation. Um, a little bit more specific would be CHADS2 VASC, and that, that asks uh, more questions over here. So that can be helpful as well. So again, if you're not in primary care or cardiology settings, you don't need to memorize this, but just know that the CHADS score, the CHADS2 VASC, can help decide when um, anti, either antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy is necessary for AFib. Uh, the typical anticoagulants I'll just mention would be classically, it's been warfarin. Um, and so warfarin has been um, the, the main thing given. The thing with warfarin, remember, is that um, you know, patients need to have their INRs, their clotting times regularly monitored. And we usually keep the INR between two and three. So if they're now you add Chinese herbs or something into that, uh, it might change the INR and they're gonna need to readjust the dose of warfarin. The newer agents uh, like the dabigatran, this is uh, one of those novel oral anticoagulants, uh, these do not need to have INRs checked. So we're seeing a lot of patients now transition to the newer agents um, and uh, we don't need to do is the regular kind of monitoring anymore. Um, so that would be the stroke prevention, either anticoagulants or antiplatelet, depending on the patient's needs. Um, and then either rate control again, rhythm control, uh, electrocardioversion, or cardiac ablation. So we just went through those. Um, here's a little picture of the kind of what's happening in, here's a normal heart rhythm to the left with an SA node firing, AV node. So we have this cardiac conduction um, all going through the AV node down. Um, but with uh, AFib, we're having a, basically the SA node goes offline and we're getting all these ectopic pacemakers. And so they're firing on their own. And so the atria are then sort of just quivering in place. And so the blood is just gonna pool there. And again, that's gonna increase the risk of thrombosis. Uh, so that is uh, atrial fibrillation. Again, very common. Um, can be if you feel a rapid um, but irregular uh, pulse, um, that could be one potential sign, especially in an older patient of atrial fibrillation, and especially if they're symptomatic with lightheadedness or they've had an episode of syncope, they definitely need a referral if they haven't had it for an ECG, and they need to be worked up to be sure they don't have either AFib or another uh, potentially uh, dangerous arrhythmia. So I'll just cover a couple of other supraventricular tachycardia. So there's multifocal atrial tachycardia, MAT, uh, where we get a um, uh, heart rate of greater than 100. Again, it's a tachycardia. And here we have three or more unique P wave uh, morphologies. So here are the ECG tracings to the right comparing AFib with atrial flutter. So notice with AFib, we're not seeing discernible P waves. These are actually the T waves here, uh, but the P waves are not really discernible and we've got irregular QRS complexes. We have the sawtooth waves, in this case, a two or three to one conduction in atrial flutter. Uh, but in multifocal atrial tachycardia, we get uh, you know these QRS complexes. So that's the ventricular conduction, but then we get these weird like um, different P waves. So this is actually a P wave. This is another P wave, but it has a different shape to it. This is another P wave. So we're getting three or more different P waves. They have different morphologies, which means there's at least three different ectopic foci that are firing. Um, this is very common in elderly patients, especially with COPD, any sort of chronic hypoxia to the heart muscle occurs after MIs, uh, low electrolyte states or high thyroid, and then different drugs like theophylline uh, and digitalis. Um, 
here, patients usually are symptomatic with palpitations, uh, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and maybe chest pain and even syncope. Um, the treatment is to address the underlying disorder like the chronic uh, pulmonary disease. And then typically rate control is given um, and, uh, and so forth. But this is not very effective at suppressing the underlying pacemakers. So here is a big question of any sort of therapy we can give to improve the energy metabolism of the cardiac myocytes could be helpful here. So things like coenzyme Q10, uh, any sort of mitochondrial support, uh, blood moving herbs, which would all improve the aspects of the, my, uh, the myocardium or sympathetic relaxant nerves like nervines, like passionflower, motherwort, lycopis, those kinds of herbs would all be potential adjunctive therapies that might be helpful here. I haven't treated anyone with this, but those would be things that would come to mind uh, in addition to the beta blockers or the calcium channel blockers. Um, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia is basically where we get a single um, ectopic pacemaker in the atrium, not multiple ones. So we can call this a unifocal atrial tachycardia. And uh, so we see here an unusual P wave uh, before each QRS complex, but it's the morphology, the shape is the same in each one, meaning it's a single pacemaker. Um, and so this causes a very rapid firing, faster than the SA node. Um, and again, this could decrease cardiac output. So that'd be a paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Again, all these would present clinically with uh, tachycardia. Um, and uh, so this is, again, anytime a patient has tachycardia, we really want to refer them for an ECG, and then we can distinguish these different rhythms from that. Now, when patients come to the clinic saying they have a supraventricular tachycardia, they usually mean one of these two, although technically all the ones I've just discussed are supraventricular. Uh, so in atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia, what happens here is um, the, so if here's the AV node um, and it's going down into the bundle of Hiss and that goes into the bundle branches, um, and the AV node is collecting all the signals from the atrium. So the AV node fires, and instead of going down um, here, it's actually going into the atria and looping around and causing the AV node to fire again very quickly. So um, this usually presents with a very rapid heart rate between 150 and 250 beats per minute. Uh, the P wave is often buried in the QRS complex. So you can see uh, in the uh, ECG here in the yellow, um, there's a, here's a, you know, here's the, uh, this is actually the repolarization wave. Here we have a QRS complex is very narrow and then immediately it fires again and we get another. So this is, uh, the AV NRT. Um, the, uh, depolarization actually depolarizes the atrium and the ventricles together simultaneously, uh, or nearly simultaneously. So that means that the blood can't adequately flow from the atria into the ventricles. So again, this would often result in decreased cardiac output. And uh, it's most common in females, over 75% of cases. Uh, again, our usual triggers of low electrolytes, high thyroid can trigger it. Um, but a lot of cases are sort of idiopathic. We're not sure what, what the actual trigger is for them. Uh, but it can be very uncomfortable. One of the procedures that's done is to try to increase vagal tone via carotid massage, doing a valsalva where you hold your breath, you bear down, uh, that all increases parasympathetic outflow. Uh, adenosine is a medication that can do that. And that often can stop the uh, arrhythmia. So if a person goes to the emergency room, they might be given adenosine to, to try to stop it. Uh, the other would be doing rate control again through beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Um, if a patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, they're getting a lot of syncope, low cardiac output, they might try cardioversion, again, using the external pads, and they might try to shock the heart back into a normal rhythm, or uh, they can even do a radiofrequency ablation long-term if this persists. So that's uh, atrial ventricular nodal reentry uh, tachycardia. So it's basically staying in or around the AV node. The other form of supraventricular tachycardia would be atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia. And there, this happens most commonly with patients with that bundle of Kent that I discussed. So this is an accessory pathway. Um, so basically what happens is, is that instead of all the atrial signals uh, going down to the AV node here, if you look at the diagram to the right, they can actually go up the Purkinje fibers and then re-enter the atria and re-trigger the AV node, and so they cause this re-entrance circuit. 
Um, and uh, this condition is known as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, WPW. Um, this is a congenital thing. Uh, most people are diagnosed with this fairly early in life. Uh, it's found in about 0.1 to 0.3% of the population. And so we have this weird sort of reciprocating uh, electrical current between the, the atrium and the ventricles around the AV node. Um, so this, this is what we call a pre-excitation of the atrium. So it's not the SA node that's exciting anymore, the atrium, it's this, this accessory rhythm. Um, so the ECG findings, we'd have a P wave actually after a normal QRS complex. So here's the P waves. Uh, they're actually following right after. And then here we have the abnormal um, uh, beats, the uh, abnormal atrial contraction. So um, that's uh, the typical finding there. Um, we also have an upsloping, and this is called a delta wave, uh, sort of an upsloping of that uh, right before the QRS complex. So right here. Uh, so that's a delta wave. So these are all, again, you don't need to memorize this, but specific changes on the ECG. Um, again, the cause is an ectopic connection between the atrium and the ventricles, the bundle of Kent causes the reentry circuit. Uh, anything, again, that is going to make the heart more jumpy, increase sympathetic tone, like thyrotoxicosis, low electrolytes will trigger it. Um, and again, it can be symptomatic, even causing syncope. And I've had uh, several patients with this and, uh, you know, they try, the treatment is going to be the same as the AV NRT with trying to increase vagal tone or using the rate or rhythm control. Um, so these would be um, some of the uh, basic, I'm sorry, not rhythm control, just rate control for uh, AV NRT. Um, so those would be when people say they have supraventricular tachycardia, some of the most common examples. Finally, we get to the ventricular tachy tachyarrhythmias. Again, um, this is going to be more serious than the atrial tachyarrhythmias because the ventricles are your main sort of pumping chambers, especially the left ventricle. So this, these are going to be much more symptomatic and uh, they can uh, potentially be fatal. Um, so ventricular tachycardia, or VT, can come in two different forms. It can be either monomorphic or polymorphic. Um, so monomorphic is easy. If you look at the uh, QRS complex. So normal, first of all, notice that you can't see any P complexes, P waves or anything here. This is a QRS complex that looks totally abnormal. It's very wide, but notice that it is sort of has a regular sine wave like appearance. Uh, and that is monomorphic. Um, and the ventricles start beating at over 120 beats per minute. So you get at least three of these wide QRS complexes in a row. That's part of the diagnostic criteria. Again, you might see dissociation between the AV node and the ventricular pacing. Um, if it happens for less than 30 seconds, so a person gets a run of these for less than 30 seconds, usually it's not severe or dangerous. But if it happens for more than 30 seconds, this can actually cause a rapid drop of cardiac output and it's much more severe. Lots of causes, usually underlying cardiovascular disease like uh, coronary artery disease, uh, aortic stenosis, cardiomyopathies, previous MI the electrolyte thyroid issues, uh, inherited channelopathies. So there is uh, some of the uh, ion channels in the conducting cells, those myocytes. There's genetic issues there, and that can cause a what's called long QT syndrome, and that will predispose a person to ventricular tachycardia. Um, and usually we find clinically that the most common cause is actually a patient that's had a previous MI. So this is one of the, the dangerous arrhythmias that can develop as a complication of an MI. Um, the presentation for the non-sustained VTAC is usually asymptomatic, but sustained, a person's going to have symptoms, eventually probably syncope, and uh, this can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation and death. So uh, we'll look at that one last, but that's where a person needs to be defibrillated uh, to prevent asystole. Uh, so the goal treatment-wise would be to terminate the episode of arrhythmia, suppress any future episodes, uh, and so typically patients might need to have the ACLS protocol. So basically they will present with the VTAC and they're going to be um, usually given a number of different medications and whatnot to try to get them back into normal rhythm. Uh, for a stable rhythm, um, then we'd use uh, different medications like procanamide, sotalol. These would be the uh, either class one or class three antiarrhythmics, beta blockers to slow the rate and so forth. And then long-term management would be beta blockers, potassium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and aldosterone antagonists. So you might see patients on combinations of those that have had a history of this. 
A lot of these patients will eventually need, if it keeps recurring, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So this is basically a defibrillator that's implanted in the chest that will shock them into a normal rhythm whenever this occurs. It's very uncomfortable. Patients will just be doing their normal activities. They'll go into this rhythm. The little sensor chip will pick that up and immediately shock them um, back into a normal rhythm. You can imagine that is quite disrupting. So that's a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. More serious is a polymorphic VT, or what we call torsade de point. And if you look at this ECG, it looks really weird. You have these, these are all QRS complexes, but they go in this kind of weird, uh, almost like a beat frequency, uh, this, this sine wave pattern. So that's a classic torsade de point. We also call this, again, a polymorphic uh, or morphous QRS complex. And the ventricular rhythm here is between, again, 150 and 250 beats per minute. Uh, usually this is caused by some sort of abnormality in ventricular muscle repolarization. And that can be associated with the long QT syndrome I just talked about. Uh, there can be different medications that can trigger this um, severe hypokalemia, low blood potassium, and chronic alcoholism, all predisposed to polymorphic VT. Uh, this can present with sudden, sudden cardiac death because this can go directly into V-fib and uh, asystole. Uh, but typically patients will be symptomatic with a uh, torsade de point. So the treatment is going to be to correct, for example, hypokalemia, remove any offending drugs. Um, IV magnesium sulfate is typically given. Magnesium can help to slow the conduction system down and uh, decrease that QT uh, interval. And then cardioversion might be needed if it's an unstable rhythm. So that's polymorphic VT. And in the final slide, I'll talk about uh, ventricular fibrillation. So uh, ventricular fibrillation, V-fib, this is the most serious of all the different arrhythmias. Um, this results in extremely rapid and irregular ventricular activity. So think of the AFib that was occurring in the atria happening in the ventricles. So the ventricles are just quivering. There are multiple foci that are firing in the ventricles to try to keep the heart alive. Um, but they're obviously not sufficient to keep adequate cardiac output. So the ECG tracing looks like this, uh, just random QRS complexes with no inherent rhythm. Um, there's negligible cardiac output, um, and the ventricles essentially are quivering in place rather than contracting. Uh, this is associated with, again, our typical heart disease issues, coronary artery disease, structural heart disease. This can occur after an MI. Uh, this is what usually when people die of an MI immediately, it's usually from V-fib. So this is uh, the classic, you know, while we go to CPR training, see a person pass out, they stop breathing, their heart rhythm effectively stops. When you feel this person's pulse, because they have no cardiac output, you're not going to feel anything. Um, you know, there's still, the heart is still quivering, uh, but the blood is not adequately being, you know, perfused in the body. So they're essentially pulseless. And, um, and this is where we need to, number one, begin CPR uh, to try to maintain you know, oxygenation and circulation to the brain. Uh, but ultimately, this is going to need defibrillation uh, if a person is going to live through this. It's very, very rare for CPR alone without defibrillation to reverse this. Um, and so this is where um, we do our BLS or uh, ACLS. So BLS is basic life support. So if you take a CPR class, that's BLS. ACLS is more advanced training. And that's what, you know, when they have the crash teams in the hospital, they have uh, different cardioverters, they have different medications they can give the patient and so forth. Um, this will degenerate into asystole and sudden cardiac death if not treated. Um, so we, we definitely need treatment. Um, death usually occurs if the normal sinus rhythm is not restored within 90 seconds of the onset of V-fib. Um, and uh, especially if a person is in asystole, it's unlikely that even defibrillation is going to do anything in those cases. So the treatment is very quick electrical cardioversion defibrillation. And this is something where, you know, if you work in any sort of medical setting, even the adjunctive care, probably a good idea to have a defibrillator in your office um, that can be used for this. Uh, there are different antiarrhythmic drugs that are usually given alongside things like just epinephrine to try to stimulate the heart again uh, and things like that. Uh, atropine to block the parasympathetics and so forth. So that is ventricular fibrillation, a medical emergency, our most severe 
cardiac arrhythmia. So I know that's a lot, but hopefully that gives you an idea of an overview of the different types of arrhythmias, what to start looking out for. Basically, when a person has either a Brady or tachy arrhythmia, a very irregular pulse, for instance, uh, although some of the tachy arrhythmias can be regular, same with the Brady arrhythmias, uh, but any of those, if you find them clinically and the person is symptomatic, they're getting lightheadedness, they have uh, exertional dyspnea, uh, things like that. They need a uh, workup. They're going to need an ECG to figure out what this arrhythmia is and uh, if it needs uh, additional treatment. So um, hopefully this gives you the foundation for thinking about how to approach that.